Um, so as Anna mentioned, I'm Manisha Ganguly. I'm an investigative journalist um, and documentary filmmaker. I specialize in open source investigations. Uh, so I, I worked for the BBC for four years. I just um, left the BBC a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I've been working uh, there for four years, working on war crimes investigations in um, sort of Libya, Syria, and now Ukraine, as well as um, exposing human rights abuses in Russia, China, and the Gulf, uh, mostly using open source techniques. So my PhD research was funded by the Communication Media Research Institute at the University of Westminster, and that was mostly to look at how um, open source investigative journalism um, is changing the way we do investigations and the impact it's having on the media industry. So without further ado, I'm just going to jump straight into it. Um, where am I? Right. Um, so when I started off with the study, I had one purely selfish aim, which was I wanted to know if in the future a robot could do my job, which is um, an investigative journalist. But then that sort of got refined into sort of my main research question, which is to understand the impact of automation on investigative journalism and journalists. And the method I chose was sort of um, qualitative semi-structured interviews with sort of 30 of the best uh, open source investigators. Uh, both in the UK as well as around the world. Um, the two main institutions that I chose to focus on uh, to compare were the BBC and Bellingcat. Um, and they have sort of opposing models um, because the BBC is obviously a heritage institution, which is slowly in incorporating OSINT into the way they do investigations. And economically, it sort of um, uh, it gets its funding partly. The World Service gets its funding from the Foreign Office, and um, the rest of the BBC uh, works through the license fee. Whereas the whereas Bellingcat was sort of formed organically in 2014, and through its success, has become uh, quite a big uh, award-winning news organization. But it's still relatively small compared to the BBC, uh, and it. Uh, sort of survives mostly um, through its funding through grants and crowdfunding. Um, also, because journalism is, is an industry where there is a tremendous amount of precarious labor, you know, you can almost say that, you know, most journalists are members of the precariat. I want it to uh, represent them. Um, sort of most of the studies that I saw on journalism interviewed exclusively staff journalists. So I wanted to get their viewpoint also because the open source space is one that has a lot of precariously employed freelance journalists. So we've got 10 um, freelance journalists that were included who are male. Um, the other thing that I noticed primarily as a practitioner and also as an academic is that in STEM fields, there is obviously a huge um, gender bias insofar as women uh, are you know, grossly underrepresented. So I wanted to sort of not replicate that bias in my study. So I've got a separate sort of group of 10 female journalists that I, um, that I put together because I put a call out on Twitter trying to create a list of all the female journalists working in the OSINT open source um, investigative space. Um, if you're interested in looking more at the women who are working in the space, the, the, the list is still up on my Twitter. Um, so the next one, sorry. Oh, I think I skipped. Yes. Um, so the broad definition of investigative journalism is it refers to any journalism that seeks to hold power to account, expose hidden wrongdoing, challenge in, uh, systemic injustices, foregrounds human rights and revolutionary humanist politics, and seeks to empower victims. What I always like to stress is that investigative journalism is adversarial in nature. There has been a lot of debate in journalism about neutrality versus objectivity. Uh, investigative journalism is always objective, but very rarely neutral, because the point of investigating something is to delineate clearly who the oppressor is and who the victim is, and then to advocate for the victim's rights. So I would say um, investigative journalism is always not neutral. The best kinds are. Um, this is one of my uh, favorite quotes, which sort of talks about the fact that it is similar to other investigative journalism, similar to other forms, but it requires special skills, a special temperament, and a special hunger. I like to think of it as a diagnosis because it requires a certain level of persistence and um, the hunger for accountability because otherwise um, the amount of backlash that most investigative journalists face or the barriers, um, it, it just means that it is a lot of work unless you're really invested in it. Um, 
I've tried to sort of create three different categories um, of investigative journalists that, that we sort of recently uh, have come across uh, because of the role that technology plays in it. The first is, of course, as um, a witness uh, to find and legitimize what is otherwise um, censored as an activist who is advocating for change and accountability as an upholder of democratic values and human rights, and often all three. Um, I uh, So just going back really quickly, um, if you're looking at sort of like examples of what's happening for the first one, a witness would be if you're looking at the war crimes investigations being done over Ukraine, that is to witness not just the ground reality, but also to fact check and hold to account the misinformation around the war, uh, hold Russia to account uh, for the misinformation. Um, as an activist, a really good example is sort of the campaigning that The Guardian did around the Windrush scandal. And of course, as an uphold of democratic values and human rights, that is sort of the general accountability politics that we see around investigative journalism. Um, so what is um, OSINT? Um, it's actually an abbreviation for open source intelligence. It's a new advent in investigative journalism because um, it's a term that's borrowed from um, the intelligence community where open refers to all sources that are sort of publicly accessible as opposed to sort of closed sources or human sources, a really good example being sort of Deep Throat um, whose um, leads sort of led to the Watergate scandal. Um, Another reason for uh, the popularity of open source um, intelligence in sort of the journalism we do is because of what I like to call um, the information chaos, or rather the information explosion that has occurred as a result of the internet and um, high speed internet connectivity um, being available sort of um, across the world. Um, the earliest definition of OSINT um, that I was able to find was in this document by a former CIA officer called uh, Robert D. Steele, who sort of puts this document together to ask for more funding and investment being put into OSINT for the US uh, military. Um, what is really interesting is because investigative journalism on national security issues or in the military is notoriously difficult due to lack of access, lack of transparency from the government, and also because of uh, the laws that the states put in place. A really good example being the Official Secrets Act in this country, the Patriot Act in the US, which came in, um, was strengthened after the Snowden leaks. Um, but then at the same time, when you're looking at sort of the large scale hacks and leaks and these dumps being available on the Internet, that has given us a certain level of access to this kind of classified information, which we'd otherwise never be able to come uh, to see or use to hold governments to account. Um, so what is OSIN based um, journalism? Um, sorry, scroll back. Um, so OSINT tools are a specialized form of automation that helps augment the process. So it doesn't automate the entire process, but what it does is, is it, it sort of helps with the discovery, the analysis and the visualization in investigative journalism, which um, when done manually, as it was previously done, would take up a hell of a lot of time. When multiple OSINT tools are used in conjunction within one workflow, that can loosely be used to describe what is known as an ocean based um, investigative journalism piece. Um, now, while OSINT has sort of replaced, uh, so replaced um, some of the manual tasks, it's not completely re replaced the entire process. And that is simply because um, it's um, the, the human knowledge and, and the judgment that is needed to not only use the tools, but also to assess whether the results sent back by the tools is accurate is still indispensable. So in a way, instead of um, just automating the full process, it's actually broadened the scope of human intervention in investigative journalism. Um, so the, what are the types of um, open source intelligence that are available. So broadly, uh, the first one is of social media intelligence, which a lot of you might be familiar with, which is mined from social media profiles on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, now Telegram, as you'll be seeing a lot of the, the Ukraine and Russia footage coming in through there. Um, geospatial intelligence is a new one. Previously, it was sort of exclusively um, within uh, the power of nation states because they were the ones who created and controlled the satellites, but with the rise of commercial satellites, 
and the availability of satellite data from companies like Maxar and Planet Labs, we are now able to actually not only see high resolution satellite imagery to sort of uh, fact check what's happening in ground, especially in conflict areas that are otherwise quite difficult to physically access, but we are also able to actually um, sort of man, um, rent these satellites to focus on specific areas of the conflict um, that you're focusing on, especially when those areas have information blackouts. Um, a really good um, example would be sort of what was happening in Donetsk, which is a contested territory in Ukraine that Russia is currently occupying. And finally, the last one is signals intelligence. It still exists uh, within the domain of state security because it's what is commonly known as wiretapping. But if you're looking at um, the, the Snowden leaks, for example, that was sort of like um, a leak of sort of um, a massive dump, which included these um, international cables and memos that we would otherwise not be able to see. That It shows that we're now able to access some level of signals intelligence as a result of this technological advancement. So, Journalism it has two sort of main functions in uh, maintaining democratic order. The first one is bearing witness, which is the act of reporting. And the second is holding power to account, which is essentially what investigative journalism does. My, my hypothesis or th uh, theory is that if one cannot have journalism without democracy, then a crisis in journalism is a reflective of a crisis in democracy. Now, the causes of crisis, um, sorry. Uh, we're going to go into the causes in a bit. Um, this is a brief overview of the impact of open source um, in, in, in the past, I would say, five years. So the first one is, uh, is a quote by Elliot Higgins in his book, We Are Bellingcat. He's the founder of Bellingcat, and he talks about how using open source, he was able to prove that the Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad fired chemical weapons at his own people, showed who was behind the downing of flight MH17, located ISIS supporters in Europe, identified neo-Nazis in Charlottesville, and also um, quashed the floods of disinformation, which occurred um, during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in contrast, my investigations, um, which I'd done with the BBC uh, documentaries teams at the World Service, um, used open source to expose war crimes, desecration of bodies in Libya, the use of banned cluster munitions in Ukraine, war crimes by Russian planes in Syria, um, exposed an online human trafficking network, uh, you know, solved the murder of Syria's last female Kurdish politician, etc. And all of this was done primarily using open source investigative journalism. Um, the reason why um, sort of um, OSINT is so popular is because of two reasons. One is it's transparent, which means that anyone could follow the, the, the steps, the logical steps, um, and come to the same conclusion themselves. And the second is accountability, which um, which has mostly been seen. So in 2017, the International Criminal Court um, allowed the um, introduction of um, open source evidence in international prosecutions for the first time. And um, since then, um, the IIM, uh, which is sort of like the international fact finding mechanism set up by the, the United Nations for Syria, um, also used open source evidence they solicited from Bellingcat as well as um, from my investigations at the BBC. And all of the evidence that primarily was in the digital realm is now being used um, to hold powers to account. Obviously these accountability processes take years, so it is still in a very early stage, but we're hopeful that it will lead to some levels of um, accountability. So um, going back to sort of my main research questions, which was what are the consequences of automation and investigative journalism? I uh, broke it down into sort of three sub questions. The first is how automated tools are changing the work of investigative journalists, the risks and advantages of conducting investigations using automated tools and the risks for the mental health of investigative journalists in the context of digital work. So the last one was sort of retrospectively added in the middle of my study, because uh, while my study focused sort of more on the impact on work, I was looking at stress 
and overwork and its impact on work-life balance. However, um, a shockingly high number of the respondents said um, or reported symptoms of severe uh, mental distress as a result of the work that they were doing, which sort of comes down to various issues that we'll um, explore in the next part. Oops, sorry. Uh, sorry, I seem to have lost this. Um, so, um, part of my study was taking all the open source tools together to create a typology. And I was able to divide the open source tools that are available into four broad categories. The first was for discovery, the second for analysis, third for visualization, and the fourth is sort of utility tools, which sort of don't fall into any specific category, but without which um, doing an open source investigation would be virtually impossible. And the time taken to learn these tools sort of depends on three things. The first is um, the complexity of the tool itself. The second is um, the learning curve of the person learning the tool. So if, for example, you're a millennial or a digital native who sort of grew up on the internet, it's obviously going to be a lot faster than if you're sort of a veteran journalist reskilling in these tools. Um, and finally, the number of applications. So by that, I mean, um, if um, you take a tool, um, for example, WhatsApp, which is primarily designed for communication purposes. But in an investigation, it could also be used to verify someone's identity. If, for example, you're trying to see if the phone number belongs to a certain suspect and you pop it into WhatsApp and their profile picture, their status uh, sort of pops up and, and you can use that to sort of um, double source things. Um, so discovery tools primarily are sort of search engine, social media accounts, satellite imagery that I use to sort of find the the initial point of the investigation that um, to build a hypothesis analysis sort of is a second stage where you sort of delve deeper into it so you either use supplementary tools like image and video forensics to confirm the authenticity of it databases or leaks to find um, secondary evidence um, geolocation tools to find exactly where something is happening um, chronolocation to find the exact time build a timeline um, so on and so forth and visualization is um, essentially so um, you are able to take the complex data that you've got um, and present it in a way that is comprehensive, which is, of course, something that the OSINT community sometimes struggles with. Um, um, so what are the sort of um, advantages and disadvantages of um, open source tools? So there are two broad kinds um, that of open source tools available in the market. The first is sort of free and the second are proprietary. Um, the issue with the free tools is that they're, they're obviously sort of at the behest of big tech. So most of them are sort of uh, created by Google um, or um, are sort of giant social media sites which hover of data like Facebook or Twitter. Uh, the first issue with these tools is, of course, they are completely out of our control. A really good example is um, a satellite imagery service called TerraServer, which used to be owned and controlled by Microsoft. Um, and in the early years of the Syrian civil war, um, TerraServer was the tool of choice to map prison deaths in the Assad regime um, at a time when Assad was denying um, or, uh, the statistics around it. But of course, it was sort of cut off, uh, well, shut down by Microsoft without any explanation uh, one fine day, I would say, uh, three, four years ago. And there hasn't been a free equivalent um, to take over that space. Um, the second issue is social media websites like Facebook, who function as a walled data garden. Now, uh, a lot of investigative journalists, me including, have used um, the content that's available on Facebook to do anything from sort of investigations on war crimes documented there to human trafficking. Um, and what that's demonstrated is that Facebook's own in-house countering violence extremism policy is not working simply because they can't keep a handle on this kind of content, which is being posted on Facebook to incite further violence, especially in extremely volatile areas like Libya, which are in a state of civil war. Uh, 
So what does Facebook do to solve the problem instead of actually engaging with journalists to ensure that this kind of content is is preserved for international prosecutions where it is evident and of course not shown to the public where it's being used to incite violence, they simply change the main algorithm. So most OSINT investigations um, are not actually possible at the same level as they were four or five years ago, simply because Facebook doesn't want investigative journalists to uh, go through their platform and find uh, horrific human rights abuses being hosted there. And of course, um, you know, Facebook has a top down structure where key discussions are beholden to a small group. Um, they have recently put uh, together an independent uh, committee. But of course, you know, the, the committee itself is on um, the Facebook payroll. So how independent they are is, you know, uh, up to debate. Um, and then you look at the sort of proprietary tools, which sort of come um with two main issues. The first is, of course, that they are obscenely expensive to the point where only large companies are able to afford and use them. And a lot of them control uh, really large um, sort of data pools that are really critical to investigations, which most independent um, journalists are no longer able to access. And the second is that a lot of the proprietary tools um, function like a black box so you can't actually see the code and you can't actually see what's happening with the data that you've inputted. So that creates two challenges. One is you don't actually know where your data is going to end up or um, you can't vouch for the security of it. And the second is you're not actually sure what's happening inside the machine. You can't actually see uh, the calculations or the analysis that is done by the machine to give a certain result. So you can't fully trust it. Um, Finally, um, the other issue is that um, there's an issue with sort of uh, the colonial overtones in the design of these uh, OSIN tools, because whoever designs the tools controls them. So with a majority of the open source tools, the tools are being designed by white male Western developers that, um, in, but these tools are then being applied to far remote, removed contacts to investigate atrocities uh, committed in the Middle East, North Africa, and the Global South, committed upon black and brown bodies, which were often marginalized, disenfranchised, and also in parts of the world where um, there is both a dearth of data leading to information asymmetry, as well as a complete lack of agency caused by systemic racism, historic imperialism, and the consequences of centuries of colonialism. Um, a really one of my favorite quotes is by um, Astrid Taylor in uh, the People's Platform, where um, she talks about um, the intersecting oppressions of race and gender, bringing with it uh, the limitations of motivation and resources, time and power, which are assets that are not evenly distributed, even if the Internet has removed many of the old barriers to entry. There are inequalities that we must take into account when we talk about a level playing field. Um, so how are automated tools changing the work of investigative journalists? The first is that they have augmented workflows. So the positive changes are that journalists simply have more that they can get done in a day. Um, verification of online content has never been more easier because there is just a variety of tools that you can use to do it yourself. Um, and which require, of course, uh, more importantly, which require minimal coding. So even if you're not technologically adept, the tools are becoming so user friendly that anyone can use it. Um, it's reduced an over reliance on human sources, and um, it's also made discovery of wrongdoing that's documented online much easier. And finally, as we saw during the pandemic, um, it's allowed for remote work and online collaborations and investigations, which was previously um, a, a huge limitation. Um, the negative changes is sort of um, quite interesting because when uh, you know you had the early theories of automation come through, uh, they were primarily sort of discussed in the context of how the robots were going to free us from work and how automation was going to create free time. But in contrast, what we've seen with sort of, uh, automation and augmentation being employed is that it's actually created more work. So what it's done is it's created so many lines of inquiry that it's had an adverse impact on work-life balance such that respondents, a lot of them, describe no longer working from home, but living at work. So 
Um, I asked um, respondents whether they felt that there was a threat from automation. Uh, and the majority said no, because they found that um, OSINT had sort of created more work and jobs. A uh, lot of the, the freelancers that I started off interviewing by the end of the study had actually found um, permanent staff contracts or fixed term contracts at mainstream media organizations. And so, you know, these, ro- these were for OSINT roles that had previously not existed even sort of three, four years ago. Um, it's impossible to automate the task of an OSINT investigator, which requires sort of the human judgment, the specialist skills, and um, sort of the, the level of human analysis, which a tool could never do. And more importantly, the OSINT tools are not error free. But the ones who did say they felt a threat from automation said it wasn't coming directly from automation, but from the broken journalism business models and capitalist modes of co- production, which prioritized profits over people. Um, So the next um, sort of section I asked um, them if um, OSINT investigators and OSINT investigative journalists experience stress. And by stress, um, obviously stress can be of two kinds. There's eustress, which is the good kind of stress that propels you to excel in your work. And then there's distress, which is negative and sort of has an adverse mental health impact. So 80% of the respondents in the study reported distress on negative impact on their mental health. Um, And 20% um, said no. Um, The causes of stress um, were sort of um, varied. So I've divided them into stress that could directly be linked back to OSINT, stress that's related to the the business of journalism, and finally, the stress that's related to the gig economy. Uh, Now, for freelancers affected by the gig economy, the stress is sort of what you might usually expect, which is the constant insecurity, poor pay, unsustainable or poor conditions of work, and the pressure to overwork and multitask. Um, For journalism, um, the main sort of stress came from um, state aggression and backlash uh, based on sort of the findings of investigative journalists, online attacks by state-sponsored trolls um, on journalists, and finally, discrimination based on race, gender, and nationality, which is something we'll come back to um, in a bit. Finally, for OSINT-related stress, the primary one that was sort of flagged by every single researcher was graphic violence and content because the one thing that we have seen in the past um three four years uh you know uh the syrian civil war was sort of the most documented um war in human history and that was primarily because we now have um extremely accessible cameras at the back of our phones which film in hd so not only is there sort of an over saturation of graphic violence um coming out from conflict zones but they're also coming out in extremely high definition. So the chances of getting vicarious trauma or being adversely affected by this is extremely high. In contrast, uh, most journalists and investigators were working for a management that was completely uninformed about the nature of vicarious trauma. In fact, most of them didn't even acknowledge it existed. Um, There's also a lack of OSIN literacy in management, which led to unrealistic expectations and deadlines being placed upon already overstressed um, OSINT researchers and journalists. And then there was, of course, a general lack of support for open source projects, even though there has that, that is slowly changing, there is still a, a reluctance to adopt these practices. Um, then, of course, there is the, the nature of OSINT investigations themselves, which sort of mirror going into um, an infinite black hole or sort of just, just going down the rabbit hole, as, as most people on the Internet call it, where there is no particular end point to it. And also, you're not really sure if what you're going to what you're looking for, you will actually find. So there's this sort of infinite nature of the investigation, which is quite anxiety inducing. Um, There is the stress of archiving the information that is available online. um, And the stress sort of comes from two different ways in in two different ways. The first is you want to archive the information before the sort of um, the the party you are accusing manages to delete it. And secondly, uh, social media websites like Facebook have sort of uh, been quite notorious, um, have been notorious for deleting evidence of war crimes 
committed in Syria and Myanmar. So there is that stress to get um, that um, evidence archived as quickly as possible before it's gone forever. Um, then there is, of course, a volume of data for investigation, which is as a result of the information explosion, the race to catch the bad guys, and finally, the lack of defined work hours in open source um, in the open source world, primarily because most of the work you're doing is online. And um, of course, um, you know, you're getting information from multiple time zones 24 seven in, in sort of an infinite way, which places a lot of stress. Um, this is sort of, um, so one of the leading causes of stress um, that was highlighted by journalists was gender and racial discriminations in newsrooms and investigative journalism. Um, this is sort of the racial makeup of respondents um, of, of which sort of 60%, despite my best attempts, was sort of uh, white, 10% um, were mixed race, 30% were non-white. And 53.3% um, of the respondents were female compared to 46 um, who were male. Um, with regards to gender imbalances, um, the main issue was with regards to the modes of production, where only a few of the investigative journalists interviewed had, had, had ever had a female investigative editor with power flowing in a top-down manner in newsrooms when it came to commissions and contracts. So the priorities were sort of slightly different when it came to sort of male and female editors. Um, especially if you're looking at sort of conflict journalism and sort of like hard news where, you know, uh, most male editors are more likely to commission stories which relate to sort of um, more sort of stereotypically masculine roles like frontline, whereas women editors were more likely to commission stories about um, rape as a weapon of war, uh, both of which are sort of uh, rape as a weapon of war is a war crime in its own right, uh, which is sort of heavily underdocumented, perhaps for, for this reason. And uh, finally, most of the respondents were identifying as tool developers, barring one were white and male, and therefore they contributed to a gendered mode of production. Um, of course, um, then we have to talk about systemic racism, which is sort of um, the power dynamics within the newsroom and the media industry as a whole, which um, resulted in the contributions of women of color being minimized. Um, a lot of them complained of not getting uh, credited in bylines for sort of um, award winning stories that they've worked on not resulting, um, and even if they were getting credited, um, they were not given the same level of recognition and acclaim compared to the work of the white uh, male peers. And then uh, finally, there was the issue of career stagnation, which was faced by most marginalized groups within the newsrooms, where most of their works and efforts remained in the background in sort of researcher roles or producer roles behind the camera, while uh, their white male peers front of the stories in front of the camera and were sort of implicitly or even explicitly given more credit for it. Um, this is um, a quote from The Colonizer and The Colonized by Albert Memmi, where he talks about how racism appears not as an incidental detail, but as a consubstantial part of colonialism is the highest expression of the colonial system and one of the most significant features of the colonialist. And um, the, the last bit is sort of quite um, succinct where he says that all the efforts of the colonialist are directed toward maintaining the social immobility and racism is the weapon for it. But what happens is that change becomes impossible and any revolt against the status quo is deemed absurd. Um, I took an, um, so an excellent, excellent example of um, the advantages of sort of race versus gender um, and, and sort of the advantages afforded to white women versus women of color um, was sort of in the BBC annual uh, report, pay report disclosures, where um, they were sort of, um, you know, the BBC was sort of making a big deal about the fact that women were even included in it. Um, so what I've done is I've taken the top 10 and I've highlighted them. So in pink are the women and in blue are the men. So right at the top, you have Gary Link, uh, Lineker with uh, 1.36 million pay. Um, but what you see is that there's only four women and um, there are absolutely zero um, people of color in the top 10 disclosures. 
despite their best efforts at diversity. Uh, the next bit sort of um, talks about the mental health impact sort of broadly. Um, so I asked respondents if they, they personally suffered from work-related mental health issues or if they knew someone who had. And 87% um, said that they personally suffered from mental health issues as a result of the work with OSINT, where they knew someone who suffered from it. And um, only 10% said they didn't know anyone. Um, gamification of OSINT is a concept I um, sort of introduced and theorized. Um, so gamification is, um, uh, of OSINT is the concept of open source as a game with incremental steps to be followed to win the grand prize, which rewards the objectification and abstraction of victims and their trauma, omits the impact it might have on investigators of color and excludes the ability of these investigators to work on such projects and through it amplifies the historic colonial gap often found in investigations of conflict. So to break it down, uh, what we have seen with the popularization of OSINT is the creation of what are popularly known as hackathons, where you know open source investigators get together and they try to sort of say, say, geolocate X number of civilian buildings in a bomb that neighborhood and um, other similar projects. But what you find is that gamification as a model relies on extrinsic motivators, which focus on recognition or prestige rather than intrinsic motivators like the desire for, ju for justice, trauma-informed processes, or goals like um, exposing human rights abusers. So what it ended up doing is it trivialized the violations in, uh, you know, in contrast to sort of a trauma-focused one, which is aware of the gravity of the violations and also humanizes the victims at the end of it. Because fundamentally, this is not a game. You are actually dealing with human beings' lives. Um, there's also sort of the, uh, a massive um, appropriation when you're looking at the labor involved in the gamification of model, because when you're sifting through large number of videos of graphic content filmed, say, in the Middle East, South Asia, or North Africa, it is um, primarily freelancers of color who bore the heavy burden of filtering through the graphic images because they um, have the language specialism, the, the understanding of that culture, but that made them more susceptible to trauma, which in turn made them appear weak or less resilient compared um, to their white male counterparts. Uh, when at the same time, you know, they were more qualified to do these investigations if they were given sort of the right amount of support and created trauma-informed processes that included um, investigators of color. Um, the causes of mental health issues that I'd previously highlighted um, were sort of could be loosely broken down into three main categories, institutional, identity, and culture. Uh, the institution would be sort of the general uninformed attitudes to trauma stemming mostly from management as well as the peers. Identity, which I'd previously mentioned, race, class, gender, and ethnicity being sort of the primary stressor for investigators of color, especially women of color. Personal background, uh, personal experience, and social background. Now, this is a really interesting one because um, if you are uh, a person of color, a woman of color, a woman, or growing up in a working class neighborhood, you are more likely or you know, predisposed to face more barriers to entry and face more microaggressions, which in turn means that you're more likely to get traumatized or have pre-existing trauma. And that's where sort of personal experience and social backgrounds come in. Um, again, uh, Class status is a big one uh, because the state of being a freelancer makes you more susceptible to mental health issues because of precarity, lack of mental health support, and of course the systems in place such as uh, low pay, constantly having to fight for your self worth, uh, to to fight for promotion of your work, to get credit and bylines, especially if you're a woman. Um, then gamification and replication of colonial tropes, which we just covered. And finally, the power imbalances, which is sort of um, structurally within um, the hierarchy. We'll come to that in a bit when we talk about alienation. 
And cultural would be sort of repression of emotions in social media, social media being that, you know, there's an expectation of constantly being online, of constantly um, tweeting slash doom scrolling to be engaged where you have no time to be sort of away from it. And if you are, you are um, expected to feel guilty for being away from your work. And of course, the repression of emotions, which is um, almost normalized in journalism, where even if you're covering the most, you know, gross violations of human rights, um, you are still expected to objectively repress your emotions, which um, is quite inhumane if you are a person of color. So uh, part of the interview, I interviewed sort of um, uh, journalists of color who were covering um, the George Floyd uh, murder. And um, they described having, you know, complete mental breakdowns after because it was just such a struggle separating their own personal experience. Because, you know, if you're growing up Black in America, I don't have to explain that to you, but, you know, you all know somebody who's been affected by police brutality. And then to have to, ex- you know, separate that personal ex- subjective experience and claim to be neutral is, is almost um, quite inhumane. Um, so, Alienation um, sort of um, is primarily characterized as a condition of workers' lack of control in the economy. And the dialectic of control and non-control between organizations, news cycles, capitalist economy, editors and journalists. But it's also, um, as David Harvey calls, um, a universal phenomenon uh, that's permeated in the processes beyond the economy, such as militarism, warfare, alcoholism, etc. Now, journalists fall at the bottom of this hierarchy where um, alienation, which is primarily um, a condition of helplessness, is characterized in three different ways. First is they have no executive or editorial power over the stories because power flows in a top-down hierarchy. Second, they have no control over the tools that they're using, as explained earlier. And third, there is this expectation to be cut off from all emotions due to this false um, understanding of objectivity when covering sort of um, really horrific violations. And... um, and it's all sort of antithetical to the values of investigative journalism because, you know, as Desmond Dudu says, to be neutral uh, in in a situation of conflict is to take the side of the oppressor. And as um, an investigative journalist, your entire job is to take the side of the victim to sort of foreground their stories and fight for their rights. So it's, it's almost um, not only inhumane, but also unethical to ask an investigative journalist to be neutral. Um, in the section titled "The Strange Labor," Marx identifies four forms of um, alienation. Uh, but fundamentally, if alienation is described as a product of unequal power dynamics, then it is no surprise that structural inequalities existing in newsrooms replicate imperialist, capitalist, white supremacist patriarchy, as bell hooks like to call it. Um, these are sort of briefly the symptoms that were reported by open source investigators and journalists just to show the gravity of the mental health impact. They range from nightmares, insomnia, fatigue, depression, mood swings, irritability to suicidal ideation, hallucinations, flinching at noises, anxiety, and finally quitting. Um, these were sort of my general recommendations, and this is the last slide, I promise. Um, um, so I've broken them down into sort of general recommendations, newsroom recommendations, OSINT recommendations. OSINT was more about sort of creation of communities of tools um, that are sort of independent of big tech, moving away from gamification, um, lesser reliance on white male Europeans, however highly skilled they may be, to tell the stories of those who have been burdened by intergenerational trauma and foregrounding the people that's heard. Similarly, for newsroom recommendations, it would be sort of overhauling standard hiring practices, interrogating the commissioning hierarchy, moving away from presenter-led documentaries, specifically white presenters fronting international stories in the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia, valuing talent over star power and the number of your Twitter followers, investing in the development of OSIN tools and trauma-conscious workflows, and mentoring women of color and immigrants, especially focusing on their career progression, um, reforming the fixed term um, contracts uh, to include adequate sick pay, holiday pay, mental health support, allowing women of color to fund their own stories, allowing journalists to influence executive decisions. And then the general recommendations are um, to do with compensation for overtime, flexibility, autonomy, equal pay for equal work, and a greater understanding of the human motivation underpinning Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm.